Hello everyone, my name is Yoshimi, and welcome back to the channel. Tonight, we are diving into part 3 of the horror game Lost Media Iceberg created by Equirep, and with it comes even more interesting cases of lost games or horror games that drastically change during development. I do apologize for the delay between entries, but also want to celebrate that this serves as my first hour-long video I have uploaded to this channel, and the first time in general making something this long. So with that being said, let's not waste too much time as we dive deeper into the depths of the horror game Lost Media Iceberg. No Known Survivors Dead Space No Known Survivors refers to a nine-part point-and-click flash game developed by Deep Focus with episodes released from August 25th to October 21st, 2008. The game would feature both 2D and 3D models and would focus on the story of two characters prior to the events of the first Dead Space game set during a necromorph outbreak on Aegis 7. The first would follow a man named George Greggs, a doctor of sorts who is trapped in a room as the necromorphs wait just outside. It is revealed that Greggs had been dating one of his patients named Jane, who had lost her fingers. Jane had broken up with him the day of the necromorph outbreak, and Greg caresses Jane's severed fingers as the necromorphs make their way into the room and kill him, with Jane's fingers becoming necromorphs themselves. The second story follows a man named Steven, right after being attacked by his friend and co-worker Gavin. Prior to this event, Steven, Gavin, and their other friend and co-worker Dennis had discovered that the USG Ishimura, the ship from the first game, was in restricted airspace. Gavin would then go to his boss, who orders Gavin to kill his co-workers to cover up the outbreak on Aegis 7. Gavin would kill Dennis and attempt to kill Steven by breaking into his room. Gavin would kill Steven and his boss orders him to await pickup. However, Gavin, feeling guilt over what he did, kills himself instead. No Known Survivors was available to play at www.nonownsurvivors.com and would be part of a contest in which players would answer questions about the lore of the game while solving different puzzles. Winners could receive the Dead Space comics, the Dead Space art book, a free copy of Dead Space 1, a copy of the film Dead Space Downfall, and more. Unfortunately, No Known Survivors is completely lost, with the website domain being sold off to a Japanese company. Only screenshots and certain assets are known to exist with the game remaining completely lost at the time of writing. Zombie Town. Zombie Town refers to an unreleased zombie shooter developed by Minecraft creator Marcus Notch Pearson. Shortly before developing Minecraft, Notch had taken part in various Java game programming contests between 2005 to 2009. These contests would task Java programmers with creating the best possible computer game with a maximum size of 4 kibibytes. Notch would develop many small games for these contests, with one particular game he developed titled Left for Kate Dead, which tasked the player with traversing a labyrinth of rooms that are only lit by the player's flashlight. The player would go through, shooting zombies and collecting power-ups as the rooms become increasingly hard. Notch also released a sequel titled Left 4 Kade Dead 2, which only really featured slightly improved graphics. After the release of the Left 4 Kade Dead series, Notch had, at one point, planned an improved concept of Left 4 Kade Dead titled Zombie Town, which would feature 3D models similar to Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars. However, Zombie Town was never fully realized as in 2009, Notch began development on Minecraft and felt that the characters of Zombie Town would fit well into it, putting them in within the first three days of development, which would give us the iconic player character Steve, who we all know and love. Not much exists of Zombie Town in terms of screenshots, though Notch did mention it a couple of times in his blog and even uploaded a brief clip of it to YouTube. Nightmare Creatures 3 Angel of Darkness Nightmare Creatures 3 was the cancelled planned threequel to the underrated survival horror game series of the same name. The game had initially been announced in spring of 2003 and set to be released for the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and Xbox. However, soon after, Nightmare Creatures 3 fell into development hell with the game's developer, Callisto Entertainment, going out of business and Ubisoft assuming the game's development duties while also acting as the game's publisher. From what we know, Nightmare Creatures 3 would follow a female protagonist exploring 19th century Prague during 
during the daytime before turning into a beast to fight monsters during nightfall. Despite this, it is reported that Ubisoft had scratched this idea, instead choosing to build the game from the ground up but would eventually cease production on it, not outright cancelling it, but rather letting the Nightmare Creature series quietly die off with the Doom sequel. Moirai Briefly mentioned in my last video, Moirai was a 2013 experimental gaming experience created by developers Chris Johnson, Brad Barrett, and Joss Osterman. The game takes place in a small village in which the player is informed that there are reports of a woman named Julia going missing and there are now strange noises coming from the nearby cave. The player is tasked with investigating these claims, exploring and speaking to villagers along the way to uncover more about Julia's story. Eventually, the player reaches the local cave and is given a knife and lantern to assist them in traversing the cave. Upon entering and exploring the cave, the player stumbles upon a farmer in bloodied overalls, also wielding a knife and lantern. The player is able to ask the farmer three questions about his reasons for being in the cave, and is given the option to either kill the farmer or let him pass. Exploring further into the cave, the player finally comes across Julia, who tells the player that she had come into the cave to end her life after her husband disappeared after finding a golden nugget and her son disappeared as well shortly after trying to find his father. At this point, Julia asks the player to assist her in ending her life, which gives you the option to either go through with the task of killing her or refuse and seek help. Regardless, the player leaves the cave and, while making his way out, comes across another farmer, this time without blood on his overalls. The second farmer is actually made to be a stand-in for the next player who would play the game, and you are given the option to enter your own answers to the same three questions asked to the previous farmer earlier, revealing that the previous farmer had also been a stand-in for the previous player before you. The game ends with the player being told that the next player will have to choose their own fate, and that you could provide your name and email address at the end, that would allow you to receive information about how many other players killed you or spared you. Moirai was a very intriguing experimental horror game for its time, with a unique pseudo multiplayer system allowing you to see some of the most absolutely unhinged answers people would leave for the questions, as well as the option to see how many players spared or killed your farmer based on your responses to the questions. Moirai was a fun little gaming experience, unlike a lot of other games, especially because of its relatively small size. Sadly, Moirai's servers were repeatedly attacked by hackers who would include things like scripts that would flood the game's database of player responses. This would cause the developers to take the system down. Despite identifying the attacker down to a single hacker, the devs lacked the time, resources, and money to fix the exploit, and the decision was made to delist Moirai from Steam and shut down the game's servers. Mortal Kombat X Ash Williams DLC This entry actually refers to a supposed planned inclusion of Evil Dead series protagonist Ash Williams in Mortal Kombat 11. According to an article on EventHubs.com by Justin Adaptive Trigger Gordon about the subject, rumors of Ash Williams appearing as a DLC fighter were spread before seemingly being replaced by the Joker in the final game. Gordon pointed towards an interview between AV Club and Bruce Campbell in which AV Club asked, you recently did Evil Dead the game, and there were rumors about Ash appearing in Mortal Kombat 11, but that never came to fruition. With buzz about Mortal Kombat 12 possibly possibly being announced soon, are you open to the idea of Ash appearing in that game? Campbell would respond to this question rather callously, stating, No, I don't want Ash to appear in other people's games. Other creatures like Freddy and Jason should be in the Evil Dead game, responded Campbell. You should be able to play as Freddy, you should be able to play as Jason, and then have Ash fight those guys. While Mortal Kombat and horror fans alike were excited with the hopes of playing as Ash in Mortal Kombat, it seems that the concept never came to fruition, and Bruce Campbell doesn't seem very enthusiastic about the idea. Pale Luna Pale Luna is a classic gaming creepypasta originally published in 2011. The story details the urban legend of an obscure text adventure game known as Pale Luna. The game was never very popular and only circulated amongst game trading circles around the San Francisco Bay Area. Pale Luna offered gameplay similar to other popular text adventures like Zork or The Lurking Horror, placing the player in a simple dark room with few direct options available for progression, leading for the game to be deemed nonsensical and literally unplayable. Those who were able to progress past the first screen were met with a buggy second screen, which would freeze if the wrong option was chosen. At this point, many players got fed up with Pale Luna's glitchy nature and gave up before ever deciphering the game's dark secrets. Pale Luna eventually fell deep into obscurity, that is until a man named Michael Nevins decided to see once and for all what lied beyond Pale Luna's cold exterior. After about five hours of trial and error, Michael had managed to progress past where most had gave up, being introduced to a new screen, this time stating, Pale Luna smiles wide. There are no paths. Pale Luna smiles wide. The ground is soft. Pale Luna smiles wide. Here, command? 
After about another hour of messing around with different text input combinations, Michael managed to get to the end screen of Pale Luna, only to be met with the simple text, congratulations, and a set of numbers. After some time, Michael realized that these numbers were actually a set of coordinates. Looking into them, it appeared that they were located in a sprawling forest within the Lassen Volcanic Park. Packed with a compass, shovel, and map, Michael made his way to the area, traversing through a path looking to see Pale Luna through to the bitter end. As he continued on, he wondered what could lie at the end of the journey. While hoping for some kind of buried treasure, eventually, Michael came upon an uneven patch of dirt. Beginning to dig, he was excited at the thought of discovery. Though, those feelings were soon dashed as Michael unearthed the badly decomposing head of a little girl. After this, Michael promptly reported his findings to the authorities and efforts were made to track down the programmer of Pale Luna. However, the trail eventually ran cold. The story ends stating that many collectors have been seeking authentic copies of Pale Luna and unfortunately, the rest of the little girl's body was never found. Pale Luna, despite thankfully not being a real game, is a classic internet horror story, one that I remember reading way back when when, and one I still often think about today. Manhunt 2 Cut Content As stated in the previous video, Manhunt 2 had a lot of content that never made it into the final game due to heavy controversy and censorship all over the world. There's a huge amount of things that were cut like weapons, characters, and executions that honestly could fill up their own entire video, but I will do my best to go over some of the more interesting pieces of cut content here. A great deal of weapons were planned but never made it into the final game. These include your more standard items like hammers, pipes, various knives, machetes, to more interesting weapons like a hockey stick, a metal hook, an acid bottle, and a chainsaw. To most infamously, a dildo weapon that even had its own unique executions. A vast number of execution animations were cut from the final game, including many environmental executions. Two characters were also cut, one known as Frisbee, who was meant to serve as the main antagonist, though he was replaced by Leo Casper in the final game. A model does exist for Frisbee in the PSP 0.01 version of the game, with modders rebuilding the entire model to reveal that Frisbee was some kind of puppet that would speak with Daniel Lamb and tell him to kill people. Another character known as Agent Prime was also planned, along with an environmental execution of the same name. However, not much is known about them at this time. Other notable pieces of cut content include female image originally being planned for the asylum, various hunter gangs having different designs, and even a couple of scrap story designs, including one where you would take on the role of a devout Christian who is told by the voice of God to kill and eliminate sinners, as well as the aforementioned story design in which the ventriloquist dummy Frisbee controls and orders the protagonist to kill people. Oddly enough, at the time of writing, a build of both Manhunt and Manhunt 2 have recently surfaced, both with a lot of cut content material in them, including much of what is talked about here. I have I haven't played through either yet myself, but I will leave a link to them in the description below. Until Dawn PS3 Until Dawn PS3 refers to a lost early version of Supermassive Games' 2015 interactive horror drama, Until Dawn, which players assume the control of eight different people trying to survive the night on a mountain as they are attacked and hunted by an unknown force. Originally, before the Supermassive Games version we know today, Until Dawn had been planned as a concept for a first-person horror game in 2008 that would utilize the PlayStation Move motion controllers. Until Dawn's early days were overseen by Sony's London studio and would revolve around two main characters, Scott Marone and Chrissy Clark, who were tasked with surviving among an 11 people group as a masked killer hunts them down one by one. Gameplay would have players explore environments equipped with a flashlight that they would use to find clues, solve puzzles, crawl, hide, and escape the killer. Until Dawn would feature a prologue episode, eight short story episodes, and one epilogue episode, with each each of the eight short stories allowing you a chance to save one character from being killed, with the ultimate goal of having the most people survive the night. This version of Until Dawn, as cool as it may have been, was eventually cancelled due to poor performance of the PlayStation Move, and eventually handed off to Supermassive Games. One build of Until Dawn PS3 is known to exist, which features an incomplete working episode. The episode was meant to act as the fourth episode, and it is said that another build exists with the same level of quality, though for the first episode. Only known footage of the found build was uploaded to YouTube in 2016 by user Ptop Online, though the build has not been made public. Keep Her Awake Keep Her Awake refers to a lost browser game from 2010 that was made to promote the 2010 reboot of the legendary horror franchise A Nightmare on Elm Street. According to Reddit user Key of Destiny 18, the game was made to promote the movie and would task players with assisting and keeping a girl awake in order to keep her safe from Freddy Krueger. Various methods were given to help
help keep the girl awake, which include things from cold showers, to medication, to even self-mutilation. The game was presented in an FMV style similar to that of Sega Saturn games like Night Trap. Very little information is known about the game and its whereabouts, aside from Kia Destiny's post about it on the Lost Media subreddit, in which they includes a screenshot of the title screen, which is also no longer available, as well as another screenshot of the girl sitting on a bed. Key of Destiny also mentioned that the game had been briefly mentioned on the Wikipedia article for the movie, as well as in a 2019 article detailing the history of Freddy Krueger's appearances in gaming. Key of Destiny also stated that the game had only been up for a few weeks before being taken down, most likely due to the aforementioned option of self-mutilation, which is extremely controversial for a Flash game made to promote a big budget movie. At the time of writing, no footage of the game exists and nobody has been able to find the game or any of its files. Interestingly, the website that the game was hosted at, KeepHerAwake.com, redirects to a page about the original 1983 Nightmare on Elm Street on the official Warner Bros. website, though it seems that the Wayback Machine has no archive of an earlier version of the URL. Garage Bad Dream Adventure Garage Bad Dream Adventure is a Japanese point-and-click adventure game developed by Kintrope for the PC and Macintosh and had a very limited 3,000 unit release in 1999. Garage is a very strange game, full of surreal, horrifying, and downright bizarre visuals, as well as graphic imagery. The game follows a rather strange looking alien-like robot as they make their way through a desolate industrial landscape. Due to the game's limited release, Garage had unfortunately fell into obscurity and never really reached anywhere outside of Japan. In 2013, a search effort for the game had been set up by 4chan's VR board. During their search, they had found several copies of Garage for sale, but were hugely expensive. It was also found that another private edition of the game had been made available for sale through game director Tomomi Sakuba's website sometime in 2004, limited to only 90 copies, which had all sold out in a single day. The private edition had come with the game, as well as concept art for the game too. Around the same time of the private edition release, the game's standard edition had also been reprinted and available in limited quantities until September 2007, where it was officially discontinued. While the game had been re-released, Garage was not available to play at all until 2014. Many people claimed to own copies of the game, but were unwilling to provide a rip of the game online as they feared repercussions of strict Japanese anti-piracy laws, though one owner uploaded an entire playthrough of the game and a couple of trailers had surfaced. At one point around 2014, a copy of Garage had been posted on Yahoo Auctions Japan and was quickly bought by a user of the video game forum Pro Boards named CC0 for 77 7,000 yen, which is about $500 USD or around $843 by today's standard. The copy was then arranged to be shipped from Japan to the US and then to Australia to be ripped by CC0, who also provided a collection of scans which included images of the game's box art, manual, disc, an included map, and more. With Garage being found and made widely available, the game also saw a release on the Google Play and Apple Store in 2021, and a Steam release in 2022 with translations in English and simplified and traditional Chinese led many to finally be able to experience Garage in its twisted, surrealist entirety for the first time. Eternal Darkness N64 Eternal Darkness is a cult classic survival horror game developed by Silicon Knights in 2002 exclusively for the Nintendo GameCube. The game follows the awakening of the Ancients, a tribe that existed long before humanity who aimed to take over the Earth. Eternal Darkness would follow 13 different characters from different time periods all uniting together to put a stop to the Ancients' plan and save Earth. While the game features many elements and mechanics seen in other survival horror games, Eternal Darkness is probably most well known for its mechanic known as Sanity Effects. Sanity Effects allow the game the ability to break the fourth wall, psychologically messing with the player if their sanity meter is too low. These sanity effects can range from minor things like a skewed camera angle or statue heads following you to suddenly dying at random points to, most infamously, the game creating the illusion that either your TV or GameCube is literally malfunctioning. While the game was released on the GameCube in 2002 to major critical acclaim and a legacy leading it to be hailed as one of the greatest video games of all time, Eternal Darkness actually started life as a planned title for the Nintendo 64. This lost build of the game was said to have utilized the N64 to allow for additional sanity effects and would have been the first N64 game to run at a 6040 by 480 resolution, with even an entirely new 256 megabyte cartridge being developed to support all the voice 
lines in the game, which were recorded in Dolby Sound. Aside from that, some changes between the GameCube and N64 version of the game were that protagonist and playable character Michael Edwards was originally going to be a Gulf War commando, but was instead changed to a firefighter following 9-11. Sanity effects were also originally planned to be played out through the entire level, only subsiding when the player raised their sanity bar high enough. Surprisingly, the N64 version was planned to be 60 to 80 hours long, with many different endings, whereas the GameCube version was only about 7 hours long, with two different endings. The most notable change was that of the character Joseph de Molay, a character who did make a small cameo in the final game, but had originally intended to be a major character, allowing you to play as the Templar as he roamed through a castle and was eventually changed to venture through the Forbidden City before being stripped down entirely in the final game. Eternal Darkness is a really great horror game that many players still look back on fondly. Despite being a hugely popular game over the years, it may be kind of a surprise to find that Eternal Darkness never got a sequel, whereas many other survival horror series did, even the ones that weren't even as good as Eternal Darkness. However, we aren't done with this game as we will be talking about it again soon in the next tier. Doom Sega Saturn Port Despite the fact that Doom did release on the Sega Saturn, it is largely considered to be the worst Doom port of all time. However, there did exist a much better concept for the game at one point. Known as Jim Bagley's prototype, Rage Software had originally planned to completely port all levels from both Doom and Doom 2 completely as they were on the PC without any changes related to hardware restrictions. This ambitious project was headed by lead programmer Jim Bagley, who developed a custom engine based on Doom's id Tech 1 engine for the Saturn. Despite the Saturn not being the best at handling 3D graphics like its Sony and Nintendo counterparts, Bagley developed the engine to make full use of the Saturn's graphics chip, and Bagley even stated that the game would be able to run at 60 FPS, which was very rare for 3D Sega Saturn games. The prototype for the game was sent to id Software for approval, and despite these impressive features Bagley had created, John Carmack was unsatisfied with the game and told Bagley to rewrite the entire code for the game to run in software mode, meaning the game would solely use CPU to run. Due to time constraints, the original idea to port Doom's PC maps to the Saturn was scrapped and instead opted to port over the maps from PlayStation Doom instead. This would cause further problems as the PlayStation maps were a derivative of the map seen in the Jaguar port and were modified to fit the system's limitations. The Saturn's architecture, however, was too complex for the team to create a satisfactory port of the PlayStation maps in such a short amount of time, leading to the Saturn port to ship with low frame rate as well as several features from PlayStation Doom being removed, like colored lighting, reverb on audio, and even the multiplayer and deathmatch game modes being absent from the NTSC release. While some footage of Bagley's prototype does exist, no playable build has ever surfaced. On the Doom World forums in 2016, Bagley himself stated that he was no longer in possession of the build source code or the Saturn dev kit used to program the game, and it was unlikely to exist in an archive somewhere. In April of 2019, a user of the site Hidden Palace named Sega Freak NL uploaded a ROM file of a Doom build dated April 10th, 1996. Not much info about the ROM file was given, but the ROM did contain a build of Doom that featured sound effects taken from the PC version rather than the PlayStation version. While this build doesn't really have any evidence that ties it to the Bagley prototype, it did lead to the idea that Rage Software possibly intended at one point to port the PlayStation version over while making it look like the PC version presentation-wise. Silent Hill Exotica Silent Hill Exotica was a rare formerly lost total conversion mod for Grand Theft Auto Vice City that would convert the game's assets and NPCs to look more like that of the survival horror game Silent Hill. The mod would feature many of the creatures and enemies seen in the Silent Hill games such as Pyramid Head, Mannequins, Faceless Nurses, Lying Figures, Groaner, and more. The mod would also replace the game's normal loads with nightmare sequences, a never-ending fog that would surround Vice City, Silent Hill protagonists James Sunderland and Heather Mason, and more. According to sources, the mod had been developed in 2016 by someone going under the name Gunby, and appeared to have been made using the Xbox version of the game, and was built on the foundation of another mod titled Resident Evil Exotica, which acted similarly but instead replacing the assets with that of the Resident Evil series. It appears that due to this, the mod was not easily accessible and therefore easily lost. That is until Reddit user Mystic Channel purchased a modded Xbox off eBay that contained the lost GTA mod, though initially they had no way of extracting the files from the Xbox. Eventually, they were able to get assistance in extracting the files from the Xbox and were able to dump the contents online, allowing those with an emulator or modded Xbox to finally experience the formerly lost
lost total conversion mod. Asylum 626 and Hotel 626. Asylum 626 and Hotel 626 are two lost horror flash games released in 2008 and 2009 created by Snack Strong Studios, a fictional development company created by Doritos with the game serving as a Halloween marketing stunt for Doritos to bring back two dead flavors of chips. Despite the games being essentially just advertisements for some chips, Asylum and Hotel 626 were pretty unique for being online flash games. First, the games could only be played between the hours of 6pm to 6am, with the first game, Hotel 626, tasking the player with exploring a haunted hotel in order to escape while encountering various hostile enemies along the way. These entities included a possessed maid, which you can spook with the flash of a camera, a demon baby, where you would have to solve a music box puzzle to lull the baby back to sleep, while balancing yourself on some floorboards so as not to wake it up, a cryptic puzzle you must solve to escape a room with an unknown individual strapped in a straitjacket, and more. The game ends with the player running through the halls of the haunted hotel as a voice guides you to the exit. Afterwards, the player was given the option to enter your real phone number in game, which would lead to a real life phone call that, if you answered, would play a message of an ominous voice stating that you haven't actually escaped the hotel. The second game, Asylum 626 is very different from the first, being set in an asylum where the player character is being operated on by doctors as bizarre footage plays throughout. Not a whole lot is known about Asylum 626 other than some interactive aspects which include having to dodge a chainsaw from an unknown killer while hiding in a closet after your parents are killed, fending off entities with a flashlight, and choosing who to sacrifice, which isn't really elaborated on in sources I could find about the game. Due to the games being just advertisements for Doritos, they were always meant to be available for a limited time and were both taken down sometime in 2011, with only gameplay on YouTube existing as the only way to currently experience the games. Dead Rising Dia de los Muertos Alternatively titled Dead Rising 5, this entry refers to a planned fifth mainline entry in the popular survival horror series Dead Rising. Shortly after the release of Dead Rising 4 in 2016, rumors and speculation began to circulate that the fifth Dead Rising game would actually follow a new character named Jack, and that early series features like a time limit, psychopaths, which were not present in the fourth game, and even photography from the first game would be included. The game was said to take place 25 years after the first Dead Rising, and would ignore the fourth Dead Rising entirely, creating its own timeline. However, this leak and rumors were completely false, and it was instead stated that this game would have followed Dead Rising 2 protagonist Chuck Green and his daughter Katie as they tracked down Zombrex for Katie to continue to slow down her zombification process. The game would be set in the fictional Mexican city of Santa Catrina during the Day of the Dead. Dead Rising 5 would take place between 2 and 3, and would have both Chuck and Katie as playable characters, each with their own set of skills, such as Chuck being able to create combo weapons like in Dead Rising 2, and Katie having some sort of supernatural powers due to long-term exposure to the virus, allowing her to telepathically manipulate zombies. The weapon combo creation system would be much more experimental, allowing the players to combine any weapons together allowing for procedurally generated weapon combos, but all these features were eventually scrapped or reshaped. Due to the shutdown of Capcom Vancouver in 2018, Dead Rising 5 was immediately scrapped and cancelled, with no new Dead Rising game being released since Dead Rising 4 in 2016. However, a developer portfolio of the ill-fated Dead Rising 5 has been found and several level design showcases have been made available for viewing on YouTube via a Reddit post by user the Nathan NS about the subject. Doom Episode 5 Like the name suggests, this entry refers to the lost fifth episode of Doom that had been planned at some point. Little is known about the possible Episode 5, with the only information of it being found in the name of some Doom asset files co-creator John Romero had released. Alone in the Dark 5 Alone in the Dark 5 was the planned cancelled fifth entry in the cult classic survival horror series Alone in the Dark. The sequel started development in 2002 to be released for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox. The game was never officially announced and was cancelled very shortly after starting development due to many factors including an unstable video game market and the decreasing popularity of classic survival horror among gamers at the time, let alone in the Dark Five, to never see the light of day. 2011 Stalker 2 Build This entry refers to an early build of the sequel to the underrated open world survival FPS RPG Stalker 2. While Stalker 2 is currently in development by GSC Game World, with a set release date for 2024, a leaked 2011 build has been found with several screenshots of it being posted to Reddit about a year ago, showcasing several interiors and exteriors, NPCs, creatures, and more. I guess 
guess only time will tell if any of this makes its way into the final version of the game. Bioshock Cut Content The Bioshock Cut Content rabbit hole is pretty deep. There's so much to talk about here that it could fill its own video. In fact, Sourcebrew has a great 40 minute long video that goes in depth on all of the cut content for Bioshock that you should check out, but I will try my best to cover some of the stuff here. Before the final version we got, there was an original pitch for Bioshock created as a means to earn financial support from publishers. This pitch would detail some of the original content, aesthetics, and game mechanics that were either scrapped or retooled into the final version. Originally, Bioshock was only going to feature one ending. It's pretty unclear how the original ending would play out, but it is said that it would be pretty ambiguous. It was stated by Bioshock's director, Ken Levine, that the ending was intended to be vague and would focus on ambiguity, with Levine stating, There are a million different things you can do in every combat. You can play it a million different ways. Looking into the future for the franchise, that's something I want to figure out, that by the time you get Get to the ending of that choice path, you have a sense of your impact on the world through lots of little permutations rather than a giant ending piece, if you follow my meaning. Bioshock would also originally include an atmospheric pressure system, which would feature areas with different levels of air pressure being low, normal, and high. This would change the dynamic lighting and fog in an area and would alter the enemy's AI, including changing their speeds, appearance, vocalizations, and more. The player's weaponry would also alter in these areas as well, such as a fireball traveling farther in low pressure areas. Other changes would include various things like different plasmids, altered level designs, original concepts for characters, and more. There is so much to Bioshock cut content that we would be here forever diving into all of it, so I definitely recommend checking out Source Brew's video for a deeper dive on the subject. Arcane's Half-Life Episode 4 Arcane's Half-Life Episode 4 simply just refers to another name given to Return to Ravenholm, which we talked about in a previous episode of this series. So if you'd like like to know more about that, I would recommend checking out that one as it contains more info on Arcane Studios' cancelled Half-Life sequel. Omori Demos Omori is an indie horror RPG developed by visual artist and clothing designer Omocat, with a Steam release in 2020 and a console release in 2022. Omori has been extremely well received since its initial release, being praised for its story, characters, gameplay, and visuals, as well as amassing a large cult following. I remember following Omocat on Tumblr way back in the day and seeing early stuff for Omori, but admittedly still haven't gotten around to playing it, but plan to do so this year. Since Omori had been in development for quite a while following its official release, there were a few demos out there for the game. Omori's Kickstarter was launched in April 2014, and following it, the dev team put together a demo for fans to play and give feedback on during GR2's Game Night in May 2014, as well as another demo released for J-Pop Summit later in July. These two events served as the only time Omori was made available to the public. The demo was notable for its difference in engine, utilizing RPG Maker VX Ace instead of the RPG Maker MV engine that the game was switched to shortly after, and the one that was used in the final game. Aside from just the engine switch, the Omori demo also had various notable differences to the game itself, including a different art style, music, as well as a different battle system UI that was more similar to Earthbound instead of the moving drawing style that we got in the final version. Another notable change was to the other world, an area in the game that was was much different, being more of a grassland with houses scattered about rather than an alien campsite. There had also been the inclusion of a yellow forest filled with moon bunnies and melons which seemed to be replaced by the junkyard in the final game. Some of the early builds content has been archived such as music, screenshots, and more which have been publicly posted to the game's kickstarter page as well as the Omori Sound Team SoundCloud and Omocat's YouTube channel. Though some songs and even the demo itself have yet to surface, with the only known entities having access access to it being the Omori dev team, as well as one Kickstarter backer, which was found to be the company Sanchi. Maybe one day for Omori's 10th anniversary or whatever, we'll finally get to play the demo. Dead Island Early Builds Dead Island and its long-awaited sequel, Dead Island 2, have a lot of cut content. Starting with the first Dead Island, various features were cut from the final version, including alternate gun color schemes, weapons like an M60 machine gun, an M72 law rocket launcher, an M1 Garand, an AK-47, and more. Other cut features include different zombie and special infected placements, as well as Dead Island originally going to include children characters to be present, but this was ultimately changed due to the risk of censorship. The game's sequel, Dead Island Riptide, featured a cut zombie known as the Crawler, which would still be able to crawl towards the player even if the limbs were removed. More weapons were removed from Riptide, including two sniper rifles, a double-barreled flare gun, and even a sawed-off shotgun. Dead Island 2 had the most notable changes throughout due to the game's long development 
development cycle. The entry was originally planned for development in 2014, with a trailer and several gameplay videos being shown off on the official Dead Island YouTube channel, but the build was entirely scrapped. That is, until 2020, when a playable version of the game's 2015 build was found and shared online, which contained a dev room with a zombie spawner and all of the items implemented in the game at that point, as well as the opening sequence of the game. After spending years in development hell, Dead Island 2 would finally see a full release in April 2023, but would still feature its own small amount of cut content, such as a crossbow, which eventually made it into the game via DLC, and even a Sawblade launcher. Distrust Distrust was the original lost early version of the PSP visual novel Danganronpa Trigger Happy Havoc that had been in development from 2007 to 2009. This version would have a plot similar to the final release. Fifteen students are trapped inside a sealed off location and forced to kill each other. In this case, Distrust would take place in a warehouse where the students had a one week time limit. Distrust's most notable departure from Danganronpa is that it would have been more serious and darker in tone, lacking the black comedy elements that would be found in the final release. Monokuma, the game's antagonist, was originally going to be depicted as a man with half of his body exposed, looking similar to anatomy models rather than the funny teddy bear we know in the final game. Distrust was also planned to be much gorier than Danganronpa, which caused Distrust to eventually be retooled into Danganronpa as the devs feared that the focus on gore and overemphasis on violence would turn off many players. The devs would later utilize brighter colors in Danganronpa as a means to subdue some of the game's more graphic scenes. Distrust would also include a trust slash distrust system that, depending on the player's choices throughout the game, other characters would gain or lose trust with you. This was obviously scrapped after the game was switched to Danganronpa. Various early versions of characters that would later be seen in Danganronpa were seen in Distrust. Leon Kuwada would be referred to as Kazuo Matsuzaki in early game footage. Makoto Nagi would instead be named Shujinko, which means protagonist in Japanese, and would be referred to as such in presentation material as well as some other footage. Another character, referred to only as Gal, was most likely an early name for Junko Inoshima, and S. Rudenberg or Yasuhiro Isogai were names seen in early game footage for the character Celestia Ludenberg. A lot of character designs from Distrust would end up being recycled into Danganronpa as well. Overall, while the finished product we got was pretty cool, I can't help but think about the original Danganronpa that we could have got. How I Spent My Summer Vacation This entry refers to a cancelled horror action children's game developed by Santa Cruz Games and planned for both the Nintendo DS and the PC. The game would follow a little girl named Joanne, armed with a chainsaw and tasked with defending her summer home from a zombie outbreak. The game was meant to serve as sort of a survival horror game for kids, however, little information is known about the game, with only one playable demo build being created before the project had been canned, possibly due to the devs not being able to find a publisher who was interested in the project. Only select screenshots currently exist at the time of writing. Scorn Beta Scorn is a first-person horror adventure game developed by Ebb Software and released in October 2022 after years in development. The game takes place in a hellish world inspired by the works of visual artists H.R. Giger and Zdyslaw Beksinski. Scorn was in development for several years prior to its final release, with a Scorn Beta being shown off and played by various YouTubers in 2000. 2017. The beta would take place in some kind of esoteric structure, where the players would be armed with a gun and tasked to explore the area's rotten landscape, unsure of what to make of anything that they are seeing. The atmosphere and gameplay style is very similar to what we would see in the final release, solving cryptic puzzles and using strange and disgusting tools to progress, though the beta is much more stripped down than what we eventually had got. Only a select few people got to access and playtest the Scorn beta as it appears it was never publicly released. Cold Fear Alpha build. Cold Fear is a third-person shooter developed for the PS2, Xbox, and PC in 2005 by Darkworks. Before the game that we got, Cold Fear was not originally intended to be a horror game. Shortly before working on Cold Fear, Darkwoods had been working on several different projects. These include other scrapped game titles like Lost Mantis slash USS Antarctica for Capcom and Time Crisis Adventure for Namco US. All projects were eventually abandoned and Darkworks were eventually picked up by Ubisoft to take over the Time Crisis this project, which would eventually evolve into Cold Fear. The Cold Fear Alpha looks quite different from the final product we got, with the environments having a different aesthetic and atmosphere being more gritty and dark compared to the areas seen in the final game. Cold Fear's protagonist, Tom Hansen, would also be much different, being a leader of a Navy SEALs team instead of a United States Coast Guard, and would instead have a shaved head rather than his blonde hair that we see in the final game. Other changes include the character Anna, instead being referred to as Irina, who would be a 
Russian Secret Service agent as well as having some unknown motives for being on the ship during the events of the game. This alpha build would be scrapped with some of the characters, plot elements, and more being retooled and overhauled to a beta build which included a lot of stuff we see in the final game. Resident Evil 2 GBA This entry refers to a tech demo of Resident Evil 2 for the Game Boy Advance developed by Italian developer Raylight Studios as a means to show off their Blue Roses engine. Despite looking pretty impressive, Capcom rejected the pitch as they lost interest in porting their games over to the GBA. American Horror Story Family Portrait Flash Game The entry refers to a partially lost flash game for the horror television series American Horror Story. According to Reddit user Cretan in Another World, the game was developed as a promotion for the release of the first season, Murder House. The game itself is similar to other horror flash games we have previously discussed, being a point and click game that allows you to interact with various pieces of the environment, often displaying creepy and disturbing visuals as you play. Various videos and screenshots of the game exist, however, the game and the files currently seem to have been completely wiped from the internet. While it may be possible to find this one, like Lost Media Hunters did with Creep, only time will tell if the game files will ever surface in a playable state. Campfire Campfire Become Your Nightmare was a planned reverse survival horror game that would put players in the role of a serial killer tasked with killing tourists and young people in the woods. The game began development in 2003 by Daydream Software, though unfortunately disappeared without any kind of official announcement. Interestingly, an article on the website Softopedia mentions that the rights to Campfire had been sold to Nordic VFX Company. It it appears that it would have been developed as a mobile game with improved graphics and as well as online capabilities and a planned release date of Halloween 2009. Though it appears that both versions are lost with only various screenshots and a teaser of the original 2003 version being available. Dead Space 2 Wii The entry refers to a cancelled port of the sci-fi survival horror action game Dead Space 2. Very little information is known about the cancelled port's development which would have been the second Dead Space title released on the Wii, following the release of the rail shooter prequel, Dead Space Extraction. Two people are confirmed to have worked on the game, XEA employee Jerry Sakas and freelancer Matt Spigens, who both list the game on their LinkedIn profile, though neither confirmed that the port was officially in development. The port was most likely cancelled due to the poor sales of Dead Space Extraction, and no screenshots, builds, or footage currently exist. Cthulhu Delta Green Returning to the Lovecraft universe, Delta Green was a cancelled horror strategy game in development by Flying Lab Software from 2001 to 2003. The game would be an adaptation of the Call of Cthulhu tabletop game. Delta Green would be a departure of the tabletop RPG though as it would take place in modern times, following secret agents of a secret US organization named Delta Green. The organization were essentially like Mulder and Scully from the X-Files where they would be tasked with dealing with supernatural events, keeping their existence secret from the general public. This sounds like a really great plot element, mixing the classic Cthulhu mythos with that of conspiracy and government cover-up. Delta Green's gameplay would feature a gameplay system similar to games like XCOM, with players commanding a squad of agents who would carry out orders you tasked them with. Flying Lab would rework the gameplay, which would allow for a third-person camera angle, allowing players to directly control any character with real-time combat. Delta Green would also allow you to recruit agents as needed, as well as the ability to upgrade your organization's skills for various things like research and analysis in order to better deal with the atrocities of the game. A major focus had also been put on AI, with companions being aware of their surroundings, taking cover when being attacked, and essentially being able to carry out tasks without having the player to do much in terms of micromanagement. Delta Green would have had a very distinct Lovecraftian atmosphere. Flying Lab felt that it wouldn't make sense to have the organization blasting down old world abominations en masse, and would instead choose to have many of the enemies be cultists, people driven mad by the old ones, and more. Flying Lab software had originally planned for a 2003 release date, and would speak with several publishers, eventually growing their team enough to be able to develop the game for not only the PC, but the Xbox as well. Microsoft had taken interest in the project, but backed out of the deal at some point, which ultimately sealed the fate of Delta Green as it never got to enter full production. Flying Lab Software would go on to develop and maintain an MMO known as Pirates of the Burning Sea for quite some time, before eventually shutting its doors in 2012. The Lost This is kind of a weird one. The Lost was an unreleased third-person survival horror shooter to be 
developed by Irrational Games and released in 2002 for the PS2 and Xbox. The Lost would be heavily inspired by Dante's Inferno and would follow Amanda Wright, a waitress and medical student that is desperate and suicidal following the death of her only daughter who was killed in a car accident. Amanda chooses to make a deal with the devil who casts her into a concentration camp-esque hell to recover her daughter's soul. Amanda is aided by Virgil from the Divine Comedy, who Amanda must free from an enchanted sword. Throughout hell, Amanda would encounter several beings known as entities, who Amanda would be able to trade identities with, which came with various different skills and powers. The Lost would have a hellish development cycle, no pun intended. The game had been overall horrible to run, frame rate would stutter and jitter, player models would become unstable, and the graphics were changed about halfway through development. On top of this, the game's publisher would choose to switch the project's publishing model to a budget game model. Due to all of this, legal problems arose and the project was just outright canceled. Strangely enough, sometime in March 2008, the rights to The Lost had been acquired by FX Labs, an Indian game studio who re-released the game for Windows as Agni, Queen of Darkness, in India, as well as in Poland and Russia as Inferno, where death is your only ally, and even in the United States as Netherworld, Beyond Time I Stand. Looking further into the re-release, it does appear that the US version is available on sites like My Abandonware, but it seems people have trouble playing the game on modern hardware. The Lost Lost is kind of a strange case for Lost Media as it technically did release with much of the same plot and gameplay mechanics intact aside from the art style change. However, it seems that we will never get to see the project that Irrational Games had been working on. Colt County Colt County was a cancelled psychological horror game developed by Renegade Kid in 2013 for the PS3, PS Vita, PC, Wii U, and most interestingly, the Nintendo 3DS. Colt County had originally been announced for the 3DS at PAX 2013 and would be intended to be an episodic horror story that would be like The Walking Dead meets Silent Hill 2. Developer Renegade Kid, known for their work on horror titles for the DS such as Dimension of the Ward and Moon, launched a Kickstarter for the game which detailed most of the information we have for Colt County. The description for the Kickstarter states, Colt County is an all new first person survival horror game that blends the episodic storytelling of The Walking Dead with the classic tension-filled exploration and action of Silent Hill and Resident Evil, presenting an opportunity for fans to help a veteran team produce a new experience that is fresh, exciting, and scary. Rebirth of the survival horror FPS genre crafted with fan input, story-driven gameplay featuring memorable character interactions, small West Texas town filled with tension, mystery, and scares, vulnerable and personalized melee and firearm combat, varied cast of creepy enemy encounters and devious boss battles. You assume the role of Gavin Mellick, whose mother has fallen deathly ill. Unable to reach your older sister, Alyssa, by phone, you drive the six hours across Texas to visit her in person and share the sad news. You return to the small town where you spent your summers as a child with Alyssa at your late aunt's house. There is a particularly savage dust storm rolling in when you arrive. Unable to locate your sister, you ask some of the locals for help. You quickly learn about their suspicions of a cultish group that recently moved into town, and the unexpected suicide of Father Pierce. The locals offer very little help finding your sister, and it isn't long before your search takes an unexpected dark turn, leading you down a road of no return. You are alone, you are unarmed, you see strange people linger on the edge of the dust storm who seem to be watching your every move, but as soon as you turn your head to face them, they disappear. Who are they? Where do they go? What do they want? As you explore deeper into the town, searching for any clues that might lead to your sister, you meet various townsfolk who offer their own anecdotes on what the people might be. Some claim they are just your imagination, and some say they are part of a new cultage group who recently moved in. One person even goes as far as to name them the Dust Devils. Ultimately, the Kickstarter for Colt County failed to be funded and Renegade Kid struggled to find a publisher for the game. After the release of Moon Chronicles and Dimension Remastered for the 3DS, Renegade Kid would close its doors in 2016, leading Colt County to fall into the abyss with it. Baldi's Basics Classic Remastered version 0.993 through 0.997. This entry refers to two lost prototype versions of the remastered release of the shitpost horror game Baldi's Basics. The two prototypes were not publicly available 
available and instead only given to a select number of beta testers and YouTubers and are pretty much identical to each other with the only difference from the final game being stated that Baldi in the party style mode gives the player a quarter instead of a present. Dead Rising Beta Dead Rising is a third person open world action adventure survival horror game developed by Capcom and released in 2006 for the Xbox 360. The game follows Frank West, a photojournalist who is trapped in a shopping mall while covering a zombie outbreak in the town of Willamette, Colorado, where West is tasked with uncovering the mystery and conspiracy behind the outbreak while assisting or dealing with various survivors along the way. The beta for the game is said to exist with a few small changes to character designs, the HUD, characters doing things different from how they act in the final game, and more. Currently, no playable version of the Dead Rising beta exists publicly. Evil Twin 2 The Messenger Much like a lot of entries on this iceberg, Evil Twin 2 The Messenger was the cancelled sequel to In Utero's 2001 horror platformer Evil Twin Cyprin's Chronicles, a game which puts you in the shoes of Cyprin, a young orphan who must traverse through a nightmarish world to save his captured teddy bear, all the while being able to turn into a demonic superhero version of himself known as Super Sip. After the first game, a planned sequel titled The Messenger was said to have begun development but never got far into it, most likely due to the low ratings and sales of the first game in the series. Honestly, after finding out about this game through the iceberg, it kinda sucks it never did better or get released outside of Europe at all for that matter. It looked like a fun game with a cool ass visual style and aesthetic. Dora Kira Hanta Otherwise known as Dracula Hunter in English, Dora Kira Hanta was a 1979 Japanese arcade game developed by Tenkan Kogyo. Dracula Hunter was very popular in Japan, but saw little to no success in other countries. Dracula Hunter features gameplay similar to that of Space Invaders, in which you would have to defend a sleeping princess from a horde of bloodthirsty vampires and the occasional bat. The game allowed the player to move around the space freely and would be tasked with killing vampires by throwing crosses that loop around the player, making it rather difficult to kill enemies. Despite the game's lack of success anywhere else, a few minor localization attempts were made but failed, and very few references in obscure gaming magazines point to the game's actual existence. Multiple photos of the game's ROM board and an exterior cabinet have surfaced via Japanese auction sites, as well as screen captures and footage of the game in action. However, a full rip of the game has never surfaced as cabinets become increasingly rare to find. City of the Dead. Also known as George A. Romero's City of the Dead, this entry refers to a cancelled 2006 first-person zombie shooter to be developed by Kuju Entertainment for the PS2, Xbox, and PC. City of the Dead was planned to be the first video game in the Dead series, which are the movies that have been directed by critically acclaimed horror director George A. Romero and include Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and more. City of the Dead would take place on the fictional island of Ningun Futoro, which means no future in Spanish, where a series of secret military tests would go horribly wrong, leaving cadavers rising from the grave and attacking and killing the inhabitants of the island. Very little is known about the game other than that makeup artist and actor Tom Savini would have been the voice and likeness of the playable character in the game, and that a one minute trailer for the game was released, though no playable build or footage of City of the Dead exists at this point. Possession Possession was a cancelled survival horror game to be developed by Volatile Games for the PS3 and Xbox 360. The game would put you in the role of a man who has been turned into a zombie via experimental chemicals who retains his intelligence, eventually planning to destroy the corporation that had created the chemicals by using a vast army of zombies to take control of the corporation and the futuristic restoration city that the game would have taken place in. Possession would utilize real-time strategy elements in which the player would command their zombies directly in order to achieve their objectives, and the game would also feature online multiplayer aspects where one player would be the zombie controller while other players would be tasked with fighting them off. As much as Possession would have been a fun game to play, the game ultimately fell into vaporware, never being officially cancelled but having development ceased on it in 2006. When asked about the status of the game, Volatile Games would respond in a message saying, Hi there, thanks for your interest in Possession. Unfortunately, we still haven't managed to secure a publisher to take on the project. We haven't given up on Possession completely, we want to see it made as much as you do. We are pursuing other games at the moment though. Best regards, 
PR department volatile games. Dead Rush. Dead Rush was a cancelled video game planned to be developed by Treyarch for the PS2, GameCube, and Xbox. The story would follow a man named Jake, who has lost his memory after an earthquake wipes out most of humanity and the town is now overrun by zombies. Dead Rush would feature an in-depth car mechanic system that would allow Jake to use vehicles to traverse the town of Eastport, serving as both a means of transportation as well as a means of armor slash defense. The player would also be able to create and build new cars using the parts of other destroyed or demolished cars, or it would be able to visit the female mechanic that would be able to install newer, more powerful parts on your ride. The game had been announced at E3 2004 and was set to be released in 2005, however, the game was unfortunately cancelled soon after. And ending off tier 3, we have Resident Evil Creative Assembly game. At one point, an untitled Resident Evil game had been pitched by Alien Isolation developers Creative Assembly that would follow BSAA agent and former STARS member Jill Valentine. Very little is known about the game, however, concept artist Brad Wright revealed three pieces of art after cleaning up his hard drive in 2015 that displayed a girl in a white dress undergoing a blood transfusion as well as two characters that may possibly have been Jill and another new or even possibly returning character. Though due to lack of any other information available about the game, we may never know. And there we have it, the third tier of the horror game Lost Media Iceberg. I do want to thank you all for watching and sitting through about an hour of me talking. It really means a lot. I will be taking a short break from the iceberg to put out some other videos on topics I've been wanting to cover and I think everyone will enjoy, which will be out soon. That being said, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's video, as well as the topics covered, and may have found a game or two you've never heard of before. This has been Yoshimi, and have a good night.